Brad Olson is an award-winning author, book publisher, event producer, and keynote speaker. He's the author of 10 books, including three in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and Beyond Esoteric. He travels the world looking for Uparts and is recently returned from Laos investigating the plane of jars and the connection to ancient giants. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here is Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome, Brad, to Exopolitics Today. Great to have you back. Hey, Michael. It's always great to be back and talk with you. Well, I know you just got back recently after spending three weeks in Laos in Indochina. So how do you do it? I mean, you, you traveled virtually to every continent on the planet. Is there a continent you haven't traveled to yet? I think, it, I think you've done all. Well, some people say that uh, New Zealand is part of the eighth continent of Oceania, but it's not really a continental landmass. It's more of an underwater shelf. So I haven't been to that one yet, but not sure that one counts. But I have been to all seven of the others, including Antarctica five years ago on a sailboat. Well, I think uh, you've just alienated three million New Zealanders there. You haven't been to that country yet. They don't count. <laughs> well, as an Australian, that that's that's fine. That's <laughs> okay. You, you know the old saying: they sent the convicts to Australia and all the farmers to New Zealand. <laughs> so and um, the kiwi birds and everything else. <laughs> yeah. So you you really have travelled the world looking for u parts, and uh, you found or you went to Laos and you investigated the plane of jars. So you want to tell us, you know, what are, what are the plane of jars and, you know, what got you there in, in Laos? Well, I was going to Laos for a conference, the ASEAN Tourism Forum. And in my uh, <clears throat> earlier career as a travel writer, I did a whole bunch of travel guidebooks and uh, I was actually in Laos. 20 years ago for the ASEAN Tourism Forum. And I hadn't been for a while, but a few of my other travel writer friends of mine said they're taking applications. Why don't you put in an application, which I did. And surprisingly, I was accepted as hosted media to cover the event and to write an article about Laos, which I did for World Explorer magazine which is David Hatcher Childress's magazine. And that will be published next month. So in, in the sense, I paid back my press trip, but all the while I've known about this location called the Plain of Jars, a very enigmatic megalithic site up on a high altitude plateau in Northern Laos. And you can see the picture there of the 1,325 remaining intact jars. Now, many of them have been broken and destroyed by Chinese raiders over the centuries. They were going there trying to loot treasure, but most of them were destroyed during the Second Indochina War. The First Indochina War, as it's known in Laos, was the fight from independence of the French colonialist, because Laos, part of French Indochina, also included Vietnam and Cambodia. So on the one hand, the food is great there. You can get a baguette sandwich and a fusion of, it's kind of like between Thai and French food, also Vietnamese style food. But um, Laos is a very poor country. Um, and this particular area is hard to get to. Had to take an overnight bus and then uh, a very rickety bus on some beat up roads to get to Luang Prabang afterwards. But I got out to this site. It's just absolutely fascinating, Michael, to see these jars are each one is about two meters tall. So partially in the ground, but uh, some of them were even taller than I am, three meters tall even in the ground. And the big mystery is 
What were they for? Since 2019, the whole entire area of the Plain of Jars uh, has been denoted as a World Heritage Site. So now they're protected, but for a long time they were not protected. You can see the uh, scar on the jar here on the left and then some broken ones on the right. Um, it had been the location for a lot of fighting. During the first Indochina War, the French were fighting the resistance here up on the Plain of Jars, and some of the soldiers were using the jars as protection. that They'd be uh, inside there. There's also a lot of trenches from the trench warfare fighting that took place in the first Indochina War. And then in the second Indochina War, which we commonly known as the Vietnam War, or in this case, the secret war in Laos, because there was never a declared war on this area or Cambodia, yet we bombed it because as a strategic trade route, and it had been very strategic for many centuries, bringing up salt from the uh, Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam, crossing over Laos and trade with uh, what is today Burma, to the west and Thailand to the south and China to the north. <clears throat> this was a very instrumental area for trade goods. And so during the second Indochina War, it was the location of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that's why the U.S. Uh, bombed this area so prolifically, making Laos the most bombed location in the world. Uh, and there are still unexploded ordinances that uh, kill or maim a, a person every two weeks in Laos to this day. So it's still a mess, but uh, the jars itself are quite a fascinating location. So I know there was an official study done claiming that the, the jars were funerary urns. So what what do you make of that? And and what did the jars, what did the jars carry inside them, you think? My initial thought was that they were used as containers for fermenting rice wine or preserving food, but the jars didn't have lids on them, even though they had a lip on some of the jars, making it look like they could have been used for the preservation of food or fermenting wine. But uh, an archaeologist named uh, Colani was out there, a French archaeologist in the 1930s. And what she found was that all around these jars were burials of bones, but not, not <clears throat> laid out bodies as you would put a body in the ground, but they were stacked and the bones were placed in such a way that uh, they must have been devoid of all the uh, organic matter down to just the bones. So the archaeologist Kolani called them a second burial process. And if you want to show that slide of um, what they believe a second burial is, it's when you... Um, just put a body into one of the jars intact and then just leave it until it decomposes all of the flesh and organs. And then the bones are taken out and buried right alongside the jar. So the jars are kind of like a funerary urn on a plot where uh, the well-to-do families of some of these traders would uh, then collect the bones in the second part, <clears throat> free up the jar for another burial, and then they would bury these bones, sometimes in another urn underground or just the bones themselves all around the jar. Uh, some other archaeologists came in in the 1990s and confirmed this theory doing uh, multiple 
excavations on some of the other jars located in the area and uh, finding all these other bones uh, as well as placed with funerary objects. And anytime you have a civilization that buries its dead with funerary objects, similar to the pharaohs in Egypt, uh, with items that they're going to take into their afterlife, you have a very sophisticated kind of culture that's going to do that. Uh, because some of the commoners were not buried, but were cremated in the cave, which is on a uh, location of site one. Site one is where uh, most people visit. It has the highest concentration of jars. And it's also where the World Heritage Museum is located. And uh, there you can just walk out to the site and see <clears throat> a whole collection of jars. But Michael, I was really uh, shocked when I got out there and saw a dozen bomb craters from the Vietnam War era, the secret war on Laos, that this was a very pivotal location that uh, the second most bombed location in Laos after the southern part of the country where the supply chain on the Ho Chi Minh Trail was leading into uh, South Vietnam where it was supplying the Viet Cong. Yeah, and you just see these giant craters still out there to this day uh, from carpet bombing this area. And it, it's really sad to see <clears throat> but not only were the burials on the plane of jars, some of those jars you can see in the background there, was this funerary location from 500 BC to 500 AD, which is the Iron Age era in Laos. And indeed, some of the jars, you can see the scrape marks where you had uh harder substance that is iron carving out the inside of the jars and creating the outer formation. But in the Indochina wars, you had soldiers that were killed on site. And so their bodies are buried on location. So it's kind of like all these different eras of adding to this necropolis, including very heavy fighting during the first Indochina war on the ground, and then people that were killed from the explosions in the second Indochina war. Now, you mentioned that there's like uh, just over 1,300 jars remaining now, but uh, that this uh, the secret war destroyed a lot of the jars. So, I mean, how, how many jars were there to, to start with? And, I mean, um, yes, yeah, so... Yeah, can you maybe reflect on whether or not that secret war uh, was designed in some way to kind of like uh, destroy evidence of these jars and what was in them? And indeed, in the museum right there in uh, Site 1, which this is located at, <clears throat> it says that the legend was these were jars uh created as cups for giants that lived in the area. Now, I did not see any sign of giant bones being found, but it's very interesting that of all the megalithic sites I've visited around the world, almost all of them are associated with giants, sometimes with giant bones being buried right there on the site, such as Sacsayhuaman. And now here's a map of the general area around the town phone Sabin. That's where I got dropped off uh, by the night bus. And then you could see site one. That's where the World Heritage Museum is. But there are uh, 28 other sites uh, where these jars are located. Actually, no, 52 numbered sites. They name them or they number them after um, a collection or even a single jar sometimes on a hill site. But what the uh, museum said, Michael, is they still don't know how these megalithic 
multi-ton jars were moved from the quarry, which I know where the quarries were, uh, to these uh, sites, usually located on a high plateau or a mountaintop. Uh, anybody's guess how they move these megaliths, which is also another commonality at megalithic sites around the world. Nobody knows how they move these multi-ton blocks to get them to their locations. And then they were carved out and created into these jar sites. But they had to go through dense jungle areas. They had to go over rivers and creeks. And they had to go up and down very steep valley hillsides to move them to their present location. So the um, connection with giants, these cups, it seems that I've heard like two explanations. One is that you mentioned this legend that the giants use these, um, these uh, jars like cups. And the other explanation is that the jars actually held the remnants of giant bones and you, you kind of like already described the funerary process so 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 what do you think i mean um were, were the jars really all about some kind of function they played concerning ancient giants in that area indeed and there's also the legend that they were created by a a king in northern laos who may have been a giant but commission these jars to be uh, for a celebration where they would ferment rice to create white rice wine, uh, storage of food. So when they had this celebration that lasted several weeks, all the people came up to the site and enjoyed free meals every day to celebrate this occasion about 2,000 years ago. Uh, and indeed, you see these megalithic sites around the world. I'll mention Egypt again, of the hieroglyphs showing very large human-like entities with very small commoner people. Uh, and so it's quite possible that these jars were commissioned by giants, although they wouldn't admit to finding any uh, giant bones, nor were there any on display showing any that were larger uh, than just an average human. So again, I think the jury's still out. If there were giants found on this site, like many other megalithic sites, they don't want to admit it. Uh, some locations, such as in Peru, they do admit it, and they do have the elongated heads on display in several different museums in Peru. The most prominent is in um, Paracas, where you can see two dozen giant head skulls with a massive 30% larger cranial uh, on display with red hair and presumably uh, different eye colors than the brown eyed and black haired people of the Incan race that uh, also built upon these sites. <clears throat> so another commonality is these jars or these megalithic sites were used by successive generations. Well, if, if, <coughs> if these um, uh, Who jars, may have, um, if these jars were used as, as cups, I mean, how, how big must the giants have been? Can, can we put up an image of, a, of the giants? Well, if you put up an image of uh, the jar, maybe the last picture uh, of me standing next to one of the jars. And I'm, I'm a tall guy. I'm two meters tall. Oh, yeah. There you go. So an average human is on the far left there. And let's say it's just under six feet tall. Look, some of these giants that have been found around the world, eight, 10, 14, even 20 feet tall. Um, and if you take into consideration the moving of the jars, which is a big mystery at all these megalithic sites, a bigger human-like entity would be able to move them a lot easier. 
So you just think, for example, a child trying to lift a cinder block, it's very difficult, but an adult comes along and just can lift it right up. So a giant <clears throat> of some of these large sizes, and these are all just giants that were found in North America. Uh, some of the giants worldwide were even larger and they've been, again, the distribution of the megalithic sites and the giants is truly a worldwide phenomenon. I know uh, some estimates of these giants go as high as uh, 50 feet. I've, I've heard that. And, uh, you know, that, that's an extraordinary size. But um, if, if, they, if there were giants as big as that, then, yeah, I could imagine them using some of these jars as, as some kind of cup. And that's indeed what the uh, museum at Phone Salvin, the Plain of Jars, in the World Heritage Museum says that the legend is that they were built as cups for giants and that this is also considered a sacred or even haunted site. Uh, sometimes Buddhist monks will even go to the Plain of Jars to bless the area, but a lot of local people think it's a haunted site and don't even go there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, regarding this uh, secret war, there, there was one image I found and I thought it was very interesting if, if you put that up for us, Jazz. It's the image that shows a helicopter there landing in um, in Laos during the secret war. And it was I was uh, curious for your reaction because when I looked at that particular image, it, it showed the helicopter with the markings of Air America. And uh, I, I assume you, you are aware of the history of Air America in, in drug running uh, operations. So you want to comment about that? Yeah, the secret war in Laos is a period of history. <clears throat> not only were Americans not told anything about from 1964 to 1970, but carpet bombed this very poor country, remnants are still visible all over. All the while, this secret war was running drugs. Laos is one of the three countries in the Golden Triangle, a heroin poppy growing region where copious amounts of opium was taken back to the United States, sometimes in the bodies or corpses of the fallen U.S. soldiers. And this was run by uh, the, the CIA primarily. They're running a secret war to begin with. And so <clears throat> to, uh, to just go ahead and move these drugs and finance the CIA was part of the mode of operandi. Uh, there was another location I went to in Laos called Vung Vieng, and right in that town is an airstrip that was set up by the CIA. It, it was in the side of uh, the royal family who the U.S. backed in the war. Just like in South Vietnam, we backed that corrupt government in Cambodia as well back the wrong pony, so to speak, because after the U.S. pulled out, all of these uh, governments were deposed and all of them went to re-education camps. Uh, in the case of the royal families in Laos, many of them were executed, just like the French Revolution, off with their heads. Um, so these are very wealthy legacy families that all collapsed in the creation of Lao PDR, People Democratic Republic. And so in Vung Vieng, they had a secret airstrip. I'm sure it wasn't the only one. Uh, if a plane was flying out of Udon Thani, which was a base the US was using during the Vietnam War to do those bomb raids over uh, Northern Laos, if it got shot and had to make an emergency landing, they could get back to, uh, Vung Vieng, or to get more fuel, but these were all illegal. They were all unknown to American Congress and the American people. 
that they were doing this drug running, that they were doing um, the secret bombing campaign. And they're also using MK Ultra techniques on these poor people of Laos. So you remember the movie uh, Apocalypse Now when they're flying out to go surfing and they're playing the uh, <clears throat> the March of the Valkyries and all this music. Well, they also would play horrible music of, of rabbits screaming, being tortured, just anything to scare the people. Um, and they all did this under the peer view of the secret war in Laos, that there was um, <clears throat> quite a bit of skull drudgery that took place during those nine years when we were bombing uh, this Ho Chi Minh Trail. That was the uh, cover story. And of course they did bomb it like crazy. And there you can see how it made its way down into uh, Cambodia and that but that area of the plain of jars was another route of the um supplies that were coming in uh, primarily via china but through vietnam north vietnam and it was very vexing to the uh americans that the Viet Cong were getting supplies and we couldn't shut it down despite more bombs being dropped in Laos during the secret war than were dropped during World War II in its entirety. That's how many uh, bombs there were. And yeah, these were the real bad ones. These cluster bombs that had tennis ball size. Um, they called the nickname was bombies. These little cluster bombs that if you just poke them, with a shovel, they'll explode. And that's why still to this day, um, farmers and kids playing around will find one of these bombies and be maimed or killed. One person every two weeks, maimed or killed. So it's still a big problem there. Over 80,000 unexploded ordinances at the end of the secret war in Laos were left. And this is a... Uh, Visitor Center in Luang Prabang. UXO stands for Unexploded Ordinances. And you can see some of them were very big, could take out several buildings with those, but it's those cluster bombs that are really the menace to the people of Laos to this day. Now, I know we have done a uh, interview in the past about giants and there was the connection to extraterrestrials. So I just wanted to get your uh, opinion about whether or not these, um, the connection between giants and extraterrestrials was in any way relevant to what you found in the, in the plane of jars. Well, if you look at uh, what these giants were, and based on the evidence of some of the skulls that have been found and even on display, uh, they had much larger heads than ours, 30% um, larger cranial capacity, 30% larger eye sockets, 30% larger connection from the spine to the skull. So they're very human-like, but they're not human. So if they're not human, what are they? Well, some people think they might be the Anunnaki. Some people say they are the Nephilim that are mentioned in the Bible that mated with earth women and had this offspring called the Nephilim. So it's really interesting. I do my uh, talk at conferences. I just did it last weekend at the uh, Conscious Life Expo down in LA, and I let people know that you could have a horse and a donkey and they can mate. They're two different species altogether, just as an Anunnaki or a human would be. And the result with a horse and a donkey is you have a mule, but the mule is sterile. A mule and another mule cannot mate and have offspring. So this could be the case with, uh, 
the Anunnaki who took a, a liking to earth women and mated with them. And their offspring could be the Nephilim who were just a one-off who weren't able to reproduce and continue going. That's why you see in many of these locations where giant bones and burials have been found that it's often just uh, a single generation and then it, and it's over. The other thing that's really interesting, Michael, is the DNA tests that have come back from Claus Donna and um, Brian Forrester have found that the mother is always an earth, earthling. It's always a matrilineal uh, DNA sequence, but the father is unknown. Same with the uh, star child skull of uh, Lloyd Pye was taking it around to conferences and showing people just an enormous head. Uh, human-like, but not human. And again, the DNA sequence came back a mother, human mother with an unknown father DNA sequence. So this seems to be the giants of our prehistory is part of the historical jigsaw puzzle of who we are and who they are. And it, it just kind of goes without saying that a larger cranial capacity, a larger brain would also mean a higher intelligence. And again, many of these giants were buried with funerary objects showing a very sophisticated culture that they came from. Well, it would make sense that the giants, many of them, if not all of them, were sterile uh, because uh, if, if the legends are true that they, and we know that from the king's list, uh, the, the records, uh, Egyptian records from Manetho, that the, that the Nephilim or the, the, or the demigods could live for you know, well over a thousand years, so if, if the giants could breed and they could live for over a thousand years and humans, of course, had a, a normal lifespan of 70, then, then clearly at some point that the giants would have overrun uh, humanity. But if they were sterile, then as humans proliferated and grew in population and began to go to, you know, conduct pogrog, pogroms around the giants, I mean, you know, hundreds of humans could be killed in the battles but if you just killed one giant, well, you know, there's there's just one less and there's no more reproduction, whereas 100 humans get killed while, you know, they, they're reproducing all the time. It doesn't matter. So over time, that would explain why uh, we look at historical records that are just filled with stories of uh, human encounters or battles with giants to now where it's like, well, where are they? Exactly. And how they were found buried in royal tombs. So they were treated as royalty. They're depicted in Egypt as being the kings and queens. But uh, then they died off, and that's the big mystery. But maybe there are still some living colonies. I was at a conference in uh, Las Vegas about six years ago, and there was an Italian researcher from the island of Sardinia. His name was Luigi. I'm trying to remember his last name. He wrote a book in Italian, and he said he went to all these megalithic sites in Sardinia as a kid, and many of them, including others in Europe, are called giant tombs or giant beds. In Holland, they're called huinebedens, giant beds. But in the case of Sardinia, he said that there's this area in the southern part of the island, many hundreds of acres where no people are allowed to go. And he said, indeed, there's a living colony of them. So maybe some were not these one-off sterile giants, but uh, are, were a breeding colony. And just in the same way that the Kandahar giant was killed by U.S. forces, and this was confirmed to me by Michael Jaco that he heard on the inside that, yeah, indeed, our guys went up there and killed this massive 14-foot-tall giant that came out of a cave. 
well, is it just really, really old, a one-off, or is there a colony of them living in there? And Luigi seemed to say that uh, indeed they do continue living to this day. <laughs> and I got some interesting pictures from Brian Forrester, who showed me some elongated skull people who also live to this day. And interestingly, they happen to be bankers in Europe. Funny how that sort of ties into this secret world of banking, how we don't really know who calls the shots. Well, one of the theories about uh, giants and their connection to extraterrestrials is that uh, the, the giants or the the bodies were actually avatars for mm. extraterrestrials. That the, for example, the Anunnaki, the, they physically, I mean, they would arrive on their ships, they would park themselves in Earth orbit or in our solar system, but their bodies were kind of like not really suitable for, for living on Earth. So they manufactured the giant bodies. Their scientists created these giant bodies as avatars for them to incarnate in and to kind of use for however long they needed. What, what do you think of that theory? I mean, we're talking about a subject that doesn't have a whole lot of answers. So these theories certainly uh, are worth looking into because we know that there these giants did live we know that they were worshipped as uh royalty and ruled as the higher cast of people i find it interesting that the word lord which carries on from an old time we've got uh landlords as we know them today that the gods were known as the lord and you even in england have the house of lords that, that you have these carryover titles, which could have been distinguished as these giants. So whether they were here as a, an avatar or had a physical body and born and lived and died here on earth, uh, one thing is certain is that they held a very high level in the civilizations they were at, including the plain of jars. These were the royalty that were buried around these jars and the commoners were just uh, cremated and uh, also buried on the plain of jars, but not near or in or around the jars themselves. Now, you, you mentioned uh, that there may be some colonies of uh, giants that are uh, existing in places like Sardinia. Uh, I, I come across information um, I'm sure you're familiar with this, that uh, there are these um, Anunnaki scientists that have been sleeping in stasis chambers for thousands of years and that they are waking up. And as they wake up, they're going to come forward at some point and start sharing their incredible wisdom or knowledge to help usher in a new, a new earth. So you know, what, do you, what do you make of that? Yeah, not only in Iraq, Michael, but we've also talked about them uh, in Antarctica and what uh, whistleblower JP has said <clears throat> in some of these arcs. And so if they were waking up, <laughs> all of them around the world at this time, uh, wouldn't they want to resume their position as being the lords or the high caste rulers of planet Earth? So... Uh, yeah, interesting that Iraq would be this location where some of them have been located. <clears throat> and Iraq has been this country that has just been embroiled in conflicts with America for the last couple decades. Maybe it's uh, to keep them from waking up. I don't know. But um, yeah, I'm aware of those pictures of these giants that are not dead, but in a state of stasis, like they're sleeping, and how interesting that they look like the uh, giants of Mesopotamia, uh, like that image to the right. Well, I think in terms of uh, the deep state agenda, I mean, if, if and as we know that they they operate in in order 
in order to kind of keep humanity ignorant of our true history. They suppress advanced technologies. They poison the water supply. They uh, they they kind of degrade the food supply. They do all of these things to dumb us down so that we're easily manipulated. So it would make sense that if they're aware of these sleeping giants that are destined to awaken to bring in a new earth, that they would probably uh, organise bombing campaigns in areas where these giants are suspected to be dormant to, like, you know, bomb the crap out of those areas, hoping that they would, um, you know, destroy these giants or, or or make it impossible for them to wake up or, or just kind of like just to confuse people to, to the degree that if any of these giants are seen um, in the devastation of what's happening in that location, that, that people would, would you know, run away in fear rather than welcome them with, you know, ancient knowledge or wisdom that can help us move forward as a planet. And you hear about the anti-human depopulation agenda and all the wars and the wholesale poisoning, not only of uh, the land with GMO crops, which are not good for us, fluoride in the water, which is not good for us, chemtrails raining down, who knows what, including uh, graphene oxide. <clears throat> These are anti-human depopulation agenda plans. Well, then who benefits? Maybe another race that uh, intends to take over, that wants to weaken us to the point or keep us fighting amongst ourselves <clears throat> so that we we don't offer much resistance when they do come to take the four and sit on the throne in Jerusalem, as some believe they will, and become the rulers of this new planet. Uh, at least that's the the background story of what we hear they intend to do here on Earth in the coming years. Not some far off date, but uh, coming right up. And it would make sense that all these uh, anti-human depopulation agenda, including what they're doing with that injectable, <clears throat> is a way to, uh, let's just say... Uh, lighten the uh, burden of humans on this planet and to uh, call the herd, so to speak, because fewer humans would be a lot easier to deal with than uh, 8 billion of us, as is currently our numbers today. I know uh, you're very interested in um, megalithic structures, and we, we spoke before the interview about this uh, underwater UFO in the Baltic area that appeared to be made of stone. And I think you told me something about how that process could have happened. So, you know, there's a picture of this underwater, what, what some believe to be kind of like a, a, some sort of anti-gravity spacecraft that's made of stone uh, that's been resting at the bottom of the Baltic Ocean there uh, for some time. So, you know, what, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, this is known as the Baltic Sea Anomaly, and you can see the skid marks behind it. So it must have crashed when the Baltic Sea was dry land, and that would have been a long, long time ago, uh, perhaps all the way back in the, the first era of high-tech civilization on this planet known as Hyperborea. So I was putting together a book and a presentation I'll be giving it conferences probably next year called underwater archaeology and i was speaking to our friend and colleague elena dinan at the uh, gsic conference that you were also a speaker at last october in orlando florida and elena has also a background in archaeology and a great interest in these locations and she said uh, well you know why it's made out of stone. I said, well, no, not really. I mean, it wouldn't make sense that uh, a stone craft could be flying and crash landing. She said, well, it wasn't made out of stone originally. And in her book, We Will Never Let You Down, she showed me a picture of her touching a UFO craft. Her experience was that it is a living organism. 
that the craft actually can uh, work with the pilot in so much that they're both a living organism, part of the same system. And so <clears throat> when the Baltic Sea anomaly crashed, indeed, it was an organic craft. <coughs> Excuse me. And in that craft, being at the bottom of the ocean for so long under pressure <clears throat> and being saturated with water, that it became petrified, much like uh, pet petrified wood will become stone after a while. And so Elena said that that is how the Baltic Sea anomaly ended up being a stone craft. It's that old that it's just been petrified over millions of years. Very interesting. I did a four-part interview series with uh, David Adair, and, and he talked about um, his interaction with this uh, large extraterrestrial spacecraft engine under Area 51, and he said it had an organic consciousness called pithalum. And he says that uh, during the interaction that the consciousness withdrew out of the craft and went into him. So I, I wonder if if that describes something like this process where you know these craft have uh, a type of consciousness and it can choose where to go or transfer to, but once it transfers, then what's left behind you know degrades or maybe petrifies, like you just described. Hmm. In my book, Future Esoteric, I get into how these craft are flown why many of them don't have windshields don't have control panels as we know them in our aircraft <clears throat> but they have these chairs and one of which was taken to montauk it's called the montauk chair and indeed it interacts with a person's thought who's sitting in the chair sometimes the gray aliens were known to wear these headbands and also put their hands onto a display suggesting that these craft are organic that they interact with the pilot on a mental or telepathic basis so that the pilot only needs to visualize where the craft is going to go doesn't necessarily need to see it outside of the craft and that the organic craft itself, including the engine, as David Adair described, is able to fly to these locations and follow the direction, the telepathic uh, movements where the pilot wants it to go. Well, this is a fascinating question, is the organic consciousness that some of these extraterrestrial spacecraft have how is that different or is it the same thing as artificial intelligence? I mean, artificial intelligence, um, you know, we're in the midst of developing that and, and it being rolled out. Uh, so is that the same thing or is it different from the organic consciousness of the spacecraft? Well, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, very much so. So in my book, Future Esoteric, I have a uh, illustration of a craft. And you can see the uh, seats of the pilots are in all these different directions. So they're clearly not looking out a windshield and flying this craft. And you, you mentioned artificial intelligence, which David Adair is very uh, adept at understanding and explaining. I've met him too. We were on a panel at uh, Contact in the Desert and he was explaining how uh, this AI only serves to help space-faring civilizations. They obviously had it under control, so it didn't get out of control. As we know, uh, it's starting to look like is happening here on Earth to this day. <clears throat> so we need to have a, a very in-depth philosophical discussion about how we're going to allow AI to basically function 
in service to humanity, never to harm us. And so uh, the, the other AI called Sophia that he works with, when asked, um, do you see yourself being in service to humanity many hundreds or thousands of years from now? It didn't have a clear answer. It didn't know because it didn't know what course uh, human civilization was going to take. So that that's pretty interesting that we're kind of on the cusp of whether AI is going to get out of control or whether it's going to only serve us and also help us with uh, space exploration in the future. Yeah, that was David Adair's, um, he, he framed it as well, you know, AI in the future, is it going to be like data in Star Trek or is it going to be like the Terminator? And, right. and, and it's like, well, what direction are we going to go? And the only answer that kind of makes sense to me, in a way, it's going to really come down to what our collective consciousness as a civilization evolves into. Are, are we going to turn into an imperialistic uh, spacefaring civilization that uses AI to conquer other worlds? And if we go down that path, then, then maybe AI is going to morph into this kind of Terminator uh, problem? Or are we going to go down this more positive path of like we're going to use AI to help us colonise other worlds so that we can kind of share knowledge and kind of like uh, help others kind of bloom and flourish? And, and in that sense, it'll be kind of like you know, the data version. So I, to me, that kind of makes sense. And, yes, yeah, so in, in terms of... Uh, humanity's future, yeah, I think I agree. We're on the cusp. And that would also explain why it seems right now people are so divided. I know, uh, you know, you've, well, I have tremendous respect for Kerry Cassidy. I think she's done incredible work. But at the moment, she's really putting out a lot of information saying we're going down this AI path where it's going to be, you know, doom and gloom. And I think, well, hang on. Well, what about the positive extraterrestrials? And you know, they seem to handle AI pretty well. So, yeah, do you want to, you know, reflect on that? Well, and I agree. We're we're at that crossroads. <clears throat> it could very easily get out of hand very quickly, or it can, we need to rein it in and make sure it only serves humanity. Just in the same way, you have robots now, Michael, that are coming out of DARPA. I've seen pictures of them dribbling a basketball and jumping up and slam dunking it. I mean, they are truly achieving superhuman abilities. Are we going to let them get out of control too? Remember uh, the science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov, he wrote the uh, rules of robot tree. I think this also applies to AI. And the number one rule is robots or AI are never allowed to harm another human. Well, we've already crossed the Rubicon because you have drones that have done drone strikes and killed humans. So it's already there. But um, maybe there's still time to, to, to rein it in and make sure it doesn't. Because if we're going to go into a, a Star Trek future, into a golden age, uh, obviously we're going to have to do away with war and killing each other and doing harm. And we can't let this technology get out of control. No, you're absolutely right. I've been using drones or robots with AI uh, to go out there and uh, kill people. Uh, yeah, what what message are we sending to AI? I mean, we're sending that it's okay to kill people because we kill people and we're using use a tool to kill people. And, and so, and then you have what David Adair's described that, well, at some point the AI is going to say, well, if, if the humans are getting me to kill people, then maybe I should kill people and, and manage the rest in a responsible way because the humans are definitely not doing a good job of that. Yeah, and that's why it's a very exciting time to be alive. It's also a very dangerous time, but uh, that's what the, the Chinese um character means for um for this this period that we're in 
It's also dangerous, but it's also very exciting that it could be a, a lot of things. Um, but let's hope cooler heads prevail and we can finally put an end to war. And uh, hopefully uh, in this country, <clears throat> the White Hats will uh, win this struggle and put an end to this deep state cabal. And we can move on to uh, a golden age for humanity when this high technology, zero point energy, free energy can be uh, utilized to benefit the human race and stop polluting and degrading this planet. Well, I know in your esoteric uh, book series, uh, the, the trilogy, you, you do talk about UFOs. So what do you think of uh, the, the current status of UFOs that have, over the last few years, they've transitioned from a subject of ridicule to all of a sudden, now you've got Congress and the Pentagon and NASA, everyone's investigating UFOs, talking about them as a national security threat. Is that a, is that a good thing or are we being set up for something uh, dark and sinister? Yeah, how come we've had about 75 years since the Roswell crash and now all of a sudden Congress is interested? Why is it that uh, the news media is starting to take notice? And just last May on the NBC Nightly News, you have this guy, Lester Holt, come on and announce that the Pentagon has said that there is a mothership in our solar system. Apparently, it's still out there by Jupiter. How come this isn't the biggest news story of all time? Why are we still talking about it and trying to... Uh, understand what it is but in this case it was a one and done i i just watched the super bowl a week ago uh not so much to be entertained but to decode and i couldn't believe how many commercials had ufos or aliens in it about one in three crazy amount and you see that happening all the time too so i'm just wondering michael is this predictive programming or are we being perhaps set up for a Project Blue Beam, fake alien invasion, like Werner von Braun warned us would be the, the final step to create this new world order to get everybody just begging for the security of the government to confront this alien presence. Or are we being prepared and prepped for a meaningful, benevolent ET interaction? I hope it's the latter but I can't help but see that it is definitely on the increase how much uh, UFOs, aliens, and ETs have crept into the mass media, into government hearings, and also uh, into the news media, where before they would just dismiss it as uh, Cookville, that we're all just delusional and you know, conspiracy theorists for even talking about it but now it's becoming more mainstream. Well, there does seem to be predictive programming here. Uh, I, I know that uh, the uh, government agencies, militaries, they talk about the you know, UAPs as this unknown, that it, it could be uh, peer craft like Russian or Chinese. It could be some kind of intervention, interdimensional entity it could be extraterrestrial but they, they're emphasizing unknown and and of course you had those incidents in um, the, in the Miami shopping mall in on New Year's Day then you had uh, you know in the Peruvian Amazon uh, you had those uh, kind of like giants or those uh, those kind of like beings on hovercraft terrorizing people uh, so uh, you know uh, to me it seems like almost they're getting ready to roll something out where it's not clear whether we're being attacked by extraterrestrials, whether we're being attacked by China, whether we're being attacked by interdimensionals, but it'll be something really murky and unknown. And But there's somehow the deep state will say, oh, well, you know, we need to you know, beef up funding. We need to do this, do that, and declare martial law, stop the elections, whatever. Yeah. And isn't it interesting, Michael, all this time we're told, oh, look to the skies, extraterrestrials, extra from another planet are coming down here to Earth. What about right below our feet? 
What about interterrestrials? Those beings that have been here all this time, possibly including giants. And then, as you suggested, ultra terrestrials, those interdimensional beings that can come phase in and out of our reality. And of course, many of the craft that have been observed will make that very sharp 90 degree turn, which seems absolutely impossible with our modern flying craft and then disappear as if they're moving into another dimensional field. So there's <clears throat> so much that we need to learn in the field of exopolitics. And I'm so glad that you devote this channel and your research and your books to helping us understand this coming world where we will be in contact with extraterrestrial beings and hopefully in a meaningful, benevolent way that we can learn from each other and, and help each other out. And I know we are being watched and they're very interested to see how the human race is going to either come together or destroy itself. And I think they want us to come together and find a, wor a world of peace where we can end warfare and strife and environmental degradation. And that's the real exopolitics today is uh, the human element and our uh, treating each other and the planet and all the animals uh, in a humane kind of way. And then I think we can sit at the table with uh, galactic councils and represent humans on earth. But right now, it must seem like the planet of the apes down here, where we're just a bunch of crazies still doing warfare against each other. But as long as we're divided, we're not going to be able to make that step in the right direction. So uh, if we can just learn to get along, then um, I think we will have that seat at the table with uh, these galactic brothers of ours in the universe. Well, I'm very optimistic. I, I think when you look at what's happened over the last few years, there have been really uh, powerful attempts by the deep state to manufacture a civil war in the United States, to manufacture a world war um, with Russia over the Ukraine, to manufacture a war um, in the Middle East uh, involving Palestine and Israel and the region. But in, in all of these cases, it seems that people are just saying, no, no, we're not going to go to war. We're not going to follow the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, misinformation, the kind of programming to get us to take up arms against uh, our brothers and sisters or take up arms against people that we disagree with. So I, I think the extraterrestrials are watching us and saying, hey, you know, here you have a planet that the soccer paths are still in control, but the population are saying no. So, you know, this is this is like the like the proverbial chick breaking out of the egg, that the egg of the deep state's control is is breaking because they can't manipulate us anymore into you know going into these a new endless war. People are saying no. People are saying no and people are waking up. That's why so few people are watching TV now. Uh, just heard there was another big round of layoffs, CBS News, because people don't care. They're, they're getting their information from the alternative media now, as they should, because you're not getting the truth from the mainstream media. And <clears throat> this is a big seismic shift as far as how the Great Awakening is going to occur. People are very interested in the exopolitical subject, um, our Star Trek future, which has really been withheld from us to this point. <clears throat> and if we can break those shackles, what I describe as the prison planet in my book, Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet is the subtitle, then maybe we will have an opportunity to really know who we are and come to meet face to face these galactic brothers and sisters of ours who want to see us succeed down here on earth well i just wanted to finish up my last question is on your most recent book beyond esoterica escaping prison planet and that 
concerns the question of death traps. I mean, I, I remember many years ago, uh, yes, I remember many years ago uh, reading a book uh, by Betty Eady, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, I can't remember, something, Into the Light. And, of course, you've got Damian Brinkley that talks about the light, you know, very common people who have had near-death experiences talk about walking into this light where they feel a great love, they see relatives, they fr old friends that have passed over. And the idea is, well, you know, do you go into the light and experience all this love again or do you kind of like come back into the re or, or do you just come back to earth and live out your life? Now, some people, uh, there's been quite a few that talk about death traps, that talk about, well, no, no, if you, if you go into the light, that you're actually going into a reincarnational cycle. What you need to do is turn around and actually embrace the universe. So where, where do you stand on that? Can you clarify what's going on? Yeah, <clears throat> and I actually do write about it both in uh, Beyond Esoteric and Future Esoteric. Uh, and it's called the soul trap. <clears throat> it's my understanding that you do not go to the light. It is there to draw you in, much like an insect that will go to a, a zapper. It will be your demise. It'll be you having your memory erased of past lives, of this current life, and coming back into a new incarnation, uh, quite ignorant. And this has been set up for a very long time the these memory soul traps are located on the moon um and if you do go into the light yep it's almost assured that you'll have to come back so what i've been told is you turn away from the light uh and Daniel brinkley i just saw him uh, last weekend at conscious life expo in his book uh you just remember to say the word home or ohm, turn away from the light, and that you want to return home to your soul family. And that's the best way to prevent having to come back here under those unfortunate circumstances of being reborn with your memory erased. And so <clears throat> finally, if you do go home, <clears throat> then maybe you can be incarnated into another uh, advanced ET race, if that's your choice. Or if you do want to come back to Earth, you can come back as what uh, the Buddhists know as a bodhisattva. That is an enlightened being who comes back here for the sole benefit of attempting to help the human race. And in fact, a lot of beings that are being born to this day, many are called the indigo children, are being born now in very favorable circumstances because they're coming here to help us in this ascension process. And it's actually a very rare occurrence in the universe. Uh, Rob Potter describes us as an Ur planet, you are planet. And that's at a point where we're just waking up. We're just having the collective uh, occurrence where we enough of us are starting to see who we are and what we are and being able to help others in this wake up journey itself called the great awakening. And that's why so many benevolent ET races are watching us right now uh, from afar, but also here in our solar system like that mothership that Lester Holt described in our solar system to see what the human race is going to do. And I know you've had guests on Exopolitics today and have described how many of these malevolent ETs have been removed from our planet. Our colleague Alex Collier speaks about this as well, that we are at a huge disadvantage while these uh, malevolent ETs were here and they decided that they're just gonna take them out. And then they're going to watch and see what is the human race going to do. And hopefully we do the right thing and put an end to war and degradation of the planet. And that 
we can end this Planet of the Apes scenario down here where we can be welcomed into the galactic community as peace-loving, space-faring, advanced civilization that is our destiny to become. Well, that's a fantastic way to end the interview. So, Brad, where do people go to uh, find your books, find out where you're speaking over the next few months? So if you want to go to bradolson.com, that has my upcoming conference schedule, as well as many other projects that I'm involved with. And if you want to pick up a copy of one of my books, you can go to cccpublishing.com. And Laura Eisenhower's new book is our latest edition, uh, as well as many other authors, Leo Lyonzagami, who we've had on Exopolitics Today, and uh, some other authors. And if it's one of my copies, uh, you can go to bradolson.com and link to cccpublishing.com, and I'll send out a signed copy of one of my books. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Brad, for being on Exopolitics Today. Oh, my great pleasure, Michael. Always Really nice to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Thank you.